Uh, welcome to uh, this DCDC session on the design and build for access to collections for teaching and research. Uh, as I've already stated a couple of times, my name is Daryl Green. I'm the head of special collections at the University of Edinburgh and co-convener of RLUK's Special Collections Leader Network. Uh, this is my first DCDC, uh, and it's been lovely to see where people are, are tuning in from um, using the, the chat window. Um, I am calling in from my home um, in East Fife, uh, and just the caveat, I've got a, a four-year-old in the room, um, so uh, we're all dealing with, with, uh, with the, the, the dangers of virtual. Um, uh, just a, a reminder throughout the session, so we've got both the chat window and the Q&A function uh, operational. Um, if you could put questions uh, into the Q&A, that helps me collate and keep track of uh, questions proper. Um, if they do go into the chat window, it's absolutely fine. We've got a couple of moderators who will make sure that questions will move across, but uh, there are two buttons down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, if you're joining in from the DCDC platform, this is just a reminder that things will work better and sound better and look better if you leave the platform and join directly via the Zoom link that's provided to you through the program. Okay, so um, it's my job to introduce uh, the session today. Um, myself and my co-convener, Joanne Fitton, uh, will be co-hosting the session today which will take us from overview to case studies to surveys uh, and our favorite, a little bit of audience participation. We'll have two moments for Q&A, uh, one just following on from the case studies that we have here in the, in the, the, the beginning of the session and another moment um, as we wrap up the session, uh, getting on towards one o'clock. Uh, and after we've heard more about uh, some of the survey and work that RLUK UK has been doing in this space. <clears throat> so, to set the scene, we've heard a great deal at DCDC this year about the pivot of our services, our spaces, and perhaps the most important thing, the kinetic nature of our work to a fully virtual and now hybrid space. So much of our work as cultural heritage professionals is about being in a space with our collections and with people, connecting our crowds or individual readers to our collections. Some of the core pillars of our work were hobbled or completely knocked over during successive lockdowns in 2020 and 2021. The reading room, the teaching space, the exhibition gallery, the lecture theater. All of these spaces needed to be reimagined, reinterpreted, and we had to bring along our staff, our administrators, and most importantly, our audiences along with us in a journey of technological experimentation and adaptation. Cultural heritage services of all sizes have been grappling with the same, the same problem this past year. How can we employ technology at all scales to reopen and reimagine access to our collections? How far beyond pandemics and lockdown will some of this technology be useful? Are we at a critical pivot point in how we deliver some of our services? All these questions have been put into the panic blender this year along with a healthy dose of budget cuts, hiring freezes, research grants, belt tightening in the arts and humanities, and so on. Some services, including my home turf, have been able to employ small or medium scale technological solutions to bring the collections to a virtual classroom, as you can see here using ceiling mounted visualizers and virtual learning environments. Other services have employed desktop cameras, webcams, even old iPhones and other devices to provide access to researchers stranded at home or even a continent away. The virtualizing of the reading room is another area that we will be exploring today. So as to not steal any thunder from our case studies, I'd like to introduce our first group from the University of Bristol. <clears throat> Joe Ellsworth, Lucy Powell, and Julian Warren, who are going to live demo some of the small, medium, and large scale uh, setups that they've implemented at the university's fantastic theater collection. Joe, over to you. Thank you, Daryl. So Julian is going to share slides. Thank you. So in this demonstration session, we hope to give you an idea of how we have begun to use simple technologies to enhance off-site, 
online, real-time access to collections produced in a theatre collection reading room. We are a small team and the solutions we have found require no specific te technical expertise to operate. They are quite affordable too. Our session will include two demonstration sessions, a quick fix approach and our virtual reading room facility. Before we move to the demonstration sessions, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Prior to the pandemic, researchers from within and beyond our own institution primarily engaged with our collections through the reading room. And we supported teaching frequently with object-based learning sessions also in the reading room. Everything changed in March 2020 when the university suddenly tr transitioned online and so did we. Next slide, please. Here is the AvaVision U50 document camera, AKA portable visualizer, which runs directly off our laptops. This is a cheap solution as they cost less than 200 pounds each. When we got them, we thought we would be using them to facilitate teaching sessions, which we have done, but we are increasingly finding other uses. They have become particularly useful tools for real-time sessions with researchers triaging material to help them plan future in-person visits, as well as to select material to scan when they cannot visit. In terms of handling inquiries about collections, we are finding that a one-to-one -one visualizer session is much more time effective than a prolonged email conversation. And as researchers can quickly identify items of relevance, it makes for a much more focused request for the supply of scanned images or even capturing them on the fly during the session. The portability and the grab and go nature of this visualizer lends itself to informal pop-up responses. And whilst we purchase them to support our service in terms of teaching and research, we also think they play a role in collections management they are likely to become the go-to solution to allow staff working on site to have real-time access to collections held in our off-site stores. Using them will also save unnecessary transportation materials between sites, reduce risk of damage, and enable other staff who might be working remotely, whether in the office or at home, to see and interrogate the collections. I'll now hand over to Julian, who sat up uh, in our little reading room who will demonstrate to you. Hello. So um, this uh, is the Abavision visualizer. Um, I'm sat where I just saw that last slide that uh, Joe, Joe showed. And I started using this small um, visualizer last summer as I worked with a lecturer in the University Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship to prepare for a talk master's module in the autumn. And one of the collections we used for the module of source material was the medieval players archive, some of which you can see on screen uh, now. They're, they're a touring company that specialised in travelling light to bring plays from medieval and Shakespearean periods to non-traditional venues and outdoor spaces. And the visualiser was a great way of introducing the students to a large amount of material within the collection quickly and easily in a very similar way to how we would usually have done in our pre-COVID in-person teaching sessions without the need for prior scanning or digitization. It enabled us to be immediately responsive, reactive, and in the moment with students and academic teaching staff during the teaching sessions in a much more dynamic and hands-on way than you can be using digitized still images. Um, the projector, the visualizer works a little bit like a kind of digital version of the old overhead projectors. Um, so it's hands free and you can um, flip documents over. Um, we can uh, zoom in on details. So we can zoom in here. This text is really, really small um, on the original print. And then you can highlight things. You can draw attention to bits. Highlighter, so this is for the Mankind play that was um, part of their 1985 uh, um, tour featuring the devil Titophilus. Um, you can also take a snapshot. Um, snapshot and capture the image kind of straight away. Um, 
which we found really useful. So that was a way in which we could um, uh, quickly take uh, uh, pictures um, and then these could get uploaded to Blackboard or Padlet or Mural or whatever other online system was being used to support the module so that the students could return to them again for future reference. The software also allowed you to record the session but we didn't use that as the recordings for the sessions we normally made on Microsoft Teams. Um, and the software itself, it came, um, let's get rid of that mark, the software itself was, came on a CD in the old fashioned way, not a problem for us archivists with our aversion to disposing of obsolete hardware. And once we'd found the DVD player and um, uploaded it, the software to the laptop, it, it's incredibly intuitive and straightforward to use. You just plugged it in and, and off you go. We also found the camera delivered a surprisingly good quality image. Um, so here we have, this is Tutavillus in action. It comes with the light, if I just turn that off, um, it sort of gets rid of, the, gets rid of the reflection. I was just going to just reset the zoom. Again. Um, and so just being able to show items like this, being able to move them around, turn them over, it really felt like we were able to give the students an experience that felt closer to the materiality of the item in comparison with that sort of stillness that you get with a JPEG file. The only restriction really is the, um, the camera itself sits about 40 centimetres or so off the top of the desk. So anything much bigger than A4 is quite difficult to kind of get, get under it. Um, but we used the, I used the visualizer again during the, the, the second semester with art history MA students who were taking an exhibition module um, in, in curating. Um, and again, it allowed us to introduce collections quickly and efficiently and taking the snapshots that were then uploaded to another app, Mural, we used. Um, and the students could then use, use that material to develop their curatorial ideas and select items um, for exhibition. It's also seen quite a bit of action from other colleagues who've been using it to show to researchers um, who've been unable to visit us um, um, in, in person. And um, the second visualizer as well, we're also using in our offsite store, as Joe mentioned, um, between colleagues. So we're able to share collections um, using it, which, which really reduced the need for us to take items back to the main campus. So that's a very quick demonstration. I'm now going to hand you back to, to Joe and my colleague Lucy, who can tell you more about recent developments. Thank you, Julian. If we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So in December, we were awarded AHRC CAPCO funding to improve our digital infrastructure in both the theatre collection and the university's special collections and to digitally enable both of our reading rooms. The idea was, was that the rooms would be equipped so that they could work in an on-site, blended or online environment, allowing us to share our physical, digital and di digitised and born digital collection in person and online in real time. Each setup for the reading rooms cost about £13,000. Whilst we initially envisaged the kit being used to help us mitigate against the effects of the pandemic, we are now realising it does have a long-term future in terms of the climate emergency, reducing carbon footprints generated by international and national research trips. Lucy is in the reading room now and she will show you the kit in action. Thank you, Joe. In preparation for a funding application earlier this year, we needed to gather evidence of an archive collection's value to contemporary research. In pandemic free times, workshops would have been held at the theatre collection, where potential researchers could view a selection of material providing inspiration for new avenues of research and opportunities for interdisciplinary discussion. Although in-person sessions weren't possible, as a result of the funding Joe's just outlined, we did have options. And using these, our workshops with academics, practitioners and creatives went online via Teams. Uh, I'm just showing you here um, the Lumens PS752 document camera, which was in the Joe's last slide. 
Uh, I found it very easy to use. It just plugs in by USB into a laptop or, or PC. Uh, it's great for displaying quite a variety of material. And I think you can see it's got a really good zoom. Really good quality. And again, you get an idea of the physicality of the material. Uh, it's also great for uh, photographs. And again, uh, as with the one Julian was using, you can turn off the lights if necessary. Um, it also, because it has a bed to it, unlike the um, visualizer Julian was showing, um, it's possible to change the lamp to um, backlight material. Uh, and so it's useful for things like negatives as well. Okay, you can get a really good zoom in on it. Uh, we also used it for showing objects. This is a more unusual item from our collections. It's a brick on wheels that was created to charm the Housing the Arts Committee of the Arts Council into uh, providing funding to a peripatetic theatre company for a van, which they wanted. This fund was normally just for bricks and mortar projects, but they were saying they wanted theatre that moved. Oh, and Joe's keen that I point out quite rightly that the use of Financial Times as a wrap is not an example of our standard storage, but it does recreate how the brick was originally delivered to the Arts Council. Uh, the visualizer does have its limits. Um, and if I show you this poster, you'll see we're beginning to get in terms of size to the limit of what it's able to cope with. So this is an A3 poster, which I have to sort of display in two halves, the top half, and then the bottom half. But because we also had the cameras embedded in the reading room for larger material, I was able to deploy that. So this is our ceiling camera in the reading room. And I've put out a selection of more outsized material uh, and I'm still sitting at my desk, but I can zoom in on material from here. And I can move the camera around. Um, this is um, an artist book which was created to record the uh, creation of a new building at headquarters for the theatre company. And uh, you can see on the left hand page, that's this actual book. These are the pages of that book being laid out um, uh, before being collated. Uh, it's also great for larger items like posters. And again, you can zoom in and get some really good detail. Uh, in numbers of participants, the sessions that we held were incredibly successful. We advertised nine 45-minute workshops, which were attended by over 40 people, including international participants. The most at any one session was seven, and I would have said that was getting to the upper limit in terms of the quality of the experience and feedback that we obtained. We were pleasantly surprised by the effectiveness of the sessions and the enthusiasm shown by participants for the archive reassured us that they had provided researchers with meaningful engagement with the collection. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. So some concluding thoughts from our experience to date. Ultimately, the use of the visualizers increases the flexibility and level of the service we can provide, regardless of whether we are operating within COVID restrictions or not. When in-person visits are not possible, for whatever reason, the virtual reading room captures something of the materiality of the collection and enables a real-time two-way conversation between the collections and our users. 
And whilst it is no substitute for in-person engagement with collections, it does seem to allow for a different type of conversation, something which is exploratory and certainly very active and where, at least to some extent, the materiality of the collection still remains evident. Thank you. And thank you, Julian and Lucy, for joining me. That was wonderful. Thank you very much to the to the Bristol team, to, to Joe, Julian and Lucy. Uh, it's great to see the, the scalability of technology uh, and its use in different environments. Uh, and we'll, we'll come back to, to the three of you in our Q&A session. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Siobhan Connery, Assistant Director for Collections and Keeper of uh, the Hunterian Books and Manuscripts from the University of Glasgow. Uh, where those attending DCDC all of this week will have ha already had a brief look under the hood of some of the exciting things that are going on there. So Siobhan, over to you, thank you. Okay, can I just check that you can see everything okay? Uh, I'm seeing the back end, of, yep, that all looks great and we can hear you just fine. Yes, that's great. Okay, well, um, thank you for um, uh, inviting me to speak today. It's good to, to join DCDC. As ever, um, I see some familiar names pop up on the on the chat, and obviously, uh, welcome to, to to new members of the conference. Um, so, like Bristol, Glasgow has developed its uh, virtual reunion service, but this case study is going to be looking more at um, collections based teaching at Glasgow um, and our response during the past uh, year or so. So, curiosity and discovery are at the heart of everything that we do with our collections at Glasgow. They form a vital part of our research uh, infrastructure. And collections-based teaching um, is a major service that features uh, very strongly in terms of our academic engagement uh, portfolio. And we deliver in normal times, uh, teaching across a range of undergraduate, postgraduate programmes, principally in the colleges of arts and social sciences. And many of these sessions and associated work form an integral part of that coursework. And some of these are core assessed works. So when the long-term impact of COVID on teaching on campus became apart last spring, the team turned their thoughts and their considerable imagination to how we could continue to support collections-based teaching. The result was a redesigned programme delivered remotely. It was a programme that was based on collaboration and co-creation, involving not only our team of librarians, archivists, conservators, and support staff, but also an amazing group of academic partners who were willing to pivot their teaching and work with us on the design. And we benefited hugely from the expertise of our team of learning technologists, whose advice early on was critical in scaling up the ambition of what we could deliver. And initially, the team's thought was uh, kind of a local kind of overhead sort of uh, viewing camera, um, but the, the, our colleagues in, in, in IT, who had worked with um, setting up um, anatomy lab and infrastructure, um, brought their skills and expertise there to, 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 to get us to think about doing something slightly grander. So, what does our virtual classroom actually look like? Well, we deliver primary source handling sessions. And this is delivered via a ceiling mounted document camera. Um, for those who want to know, it's a Wolf Vision I-14. That's what I check my notes. Um, these sessions are uh, streamed live via Zoom or other video conferencing uh, software, um, and they can be recorded in advance for asynchronous viewing. The sessions um, uh, can be recorded as a for viewing later. That's um, accessed via Moodle, which is our virtual learning environment, um, and with uh, closed caption subtitles and transcript using our Echo 360 software. So it was important that we thought from the beginning about accessibility issues and building that into design. So the camera allows, uh, the powerful camera setup allows students to peer over the shoulder um, of the handler as they leaf through items and enjoy their class. On the screen there is, is a very happy academic. <laughs> So in, in total, we delivered um, past academic year, uh, 39 classroom sessions. Um, most of these were conducted live at the class time with only um, six or so um, pre-recorded. And then the head count of those attending those sessions by our students was around 1,200 student engagements. We taught across all manner of courses from uh, information studies through to history of art, English language, 
School of Modern Languages courses, history, but we're also a uh, supported uh, collection-based teaching in the School of Social and Political Sciences, Archaeology and Heritage. We also contributed around 14 pre-recorded films, that, which were embedded in, uh, in courses uh, and available on EdShare, which is our teaching and learning repository. Um, so some immediate takeaways or observations on the reach and potential of collections-based teaching using a visualizer. As I said the, earlier, the ceiling hung camera provides an over-the-shoulder, almost vicarious handling experience. We've all seen the ability to zoom into high resolution permits extremely detailed examination of materials and materiality. For us, it also um, was a powerful and equitable viewing experience for all participants and delivered against the university's successful and inclusive learning policy goals. And probably most powerfully, um, this collections-based teaching meant that we were reaching uh, students at levels we previously hadn't reached. So previously we'd be at level four in Scotland, the fourth final year of, of, of university study or postgraduate. Those were the, the main student users of our, of our, with our collections. But in the past year, we've reached levels, entry levels, levels one, two, three, four, and five with classes at sometimes up to 200 at a time. So we're really expanding the collections beyond traditional PGT and PGR audiences. And gathering qualitative feedback, um, we've talked about the quantity there, let's think about the quality um, uh, from both staff and the students. And that's been absolutely critical to us as we've evolved and continue to evolve and adapt the service. Um, some of you may have caught earlier in the week, uh, my uh, fantastic colleague Joanna Green from Information Studies at the University of Glasgow and colleague Bob McLean presenting on, on their experience of delivering the classrooms and, uh, classes themselves. Um, Joanne has been an extremely powerful advocate and an extremely innovative user of uh, the technology um, to advance uh, her classes um, um, during this period. Um, and her feedback, um, or her contribution from the beginning and her continued feedback via her students has been invaluable. I'm not gonna read the, the whole quote there, but maybe just focusing in on about um, something that I think is important maybe come through in the discussion about how this has revolutionized how we can teach with collections digitally. It's not just a substitute, it's actually revolutionizing pedagogies. So as you see, this is more than just uh, the delivery of some high res images over, over Zoom. Um, I think where we've got real potential is, is where staff have really explored the software and have kind of exploited that and built, it, built sort of engaging exercises into their classes. So this is a screenshot here of some live polling from a class which was exploring the codicology of one of our medieval manuscripts. And another audience that we're, we're uh, consulting with and trying to get input in is from our early career scholars. Um, we need to understand what their needs are in working in a virtual environment. Um, and of course, these are the, the often people who are, ca are carrying out some teaching with the collections as, as early career scholars. Um, so this is a padlet from uh, a recent workshop we were gauging, uh, getting their, their feedback. And again, that will, that will um, feed into our future development. And one of those, um, that was actually working with the EHRC, Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities. Um, and one of their PhD candidates, uh, Chris Field, um, along with another couple of, of PhD students, uh, we commissioned to, to, to do some films. So to go and play with the, the visualizer and, and to, to feedback on their experience. Um, and I should emphasize those blue uh, lines you see on the screen are not the original. This was, this was a kind of screenshot from the film that was making, making use of the, the software. Um, but one, one of his observations struck me uh, quite uh, strongly. And I, I, if Chris wouldn't, doesn't mind me quoting from him directly. He said, the visualizer technology offers new approaches to handling and examining documents with a newfound focus on the physicality materiality and the experiential phenomenon of the archive. So again, I think there's something new here, not just a substitute.
And more recently, um, as we reconsider how blended an experience we're all going to have next year, um, uh, whether by design or, or because of uh, a further outbreak or other in, uh, sort of situations erupting, um, the team have been modelling some hybrid classes here. So um, half the class was in the room, the other half was coming online. And, and we see this as something that, that uh, is going to be more and more uh, a feature of our, our teaching offerings. And of course, the kit has huge potential um, to be used in some wider engagement activities. Um, for example, um, this year uh, was the virtual launch of our 15th century printed books catalog, um, which had over 120 uh, guests come and join us for a virtual uh, toast. Uh, just in the last month, um, we've delivered uh, a, a seminar on the 15th century book and manuscripts uh, for AMARC, which had an international audience of over 100. So I think, you know, there's there's huge potential for us to use this technology to, to broaden out um, our audience. Just a few concluding thoughts then from our experience at OCLAS when using this technology in collections based teaching. Well, the plan is obviously for continued remote delivery of teaching in a, in a whatever blended or hybrid environment it is. I think this, the, te the, the potential of this technology is, 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 is too great to shelve um, should we ever return to our pre-COVID normal world. Experimenting with hybrid classes has been raised new challenges for equity, delivering a kind of equity of experience and engaging learning. Another thing that I think struck us is, is, is that there is a bit of a skills gap or a skills hesitancy. And so I think that, um, both by perhaps not so much our teams, but maybe academic colleagues who have not really got a, a kind of conceived of how this can, we can build this kind of technology into their, their teaching. So I think there's, there's something there to, to take forward. Um, there's potential around more joined up teaching. I think we'll definitely come on to that maybe in the discussion around what a research infrastructure at scale might look like, look like either within in institutions or with museums that form part of your university or with um, wider communities um, of uh, collections. But I think at its heart, um, my, my key takeaway from this is this importance of co-creation and co-design uh, involving all the participants from the shelver, the conservator, the ar archivist, the librarian, the academic and our IT uh, it's uh, our colleagues to, to make this a, a service that evolves strongly into the future. And that was me. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Siobhan. Uh, that was great. And uh, as an attendee of the uh, Incanabula event, I'd say that the, the visualizers worked really well for that, that kind of engagement activity. Uh, so thanks very much. We'll, we'll come back to you in, in just a few minutes um, after we hear from our, our fa final case study. Uh, so our final case study comes uh, virtually from the, the gorgeous uh, John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester. Um, John Hodgson, the Associate Director of Curatorial Practices, is going to talk us through how they've established a virtual reading room service. Uh, John, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daryl. Hopefully you can hear me. Hello, everyone. This is going to be a very brief introduction to virtual reading rooms at the University of Manchester Library, with a particular focus on the researcher's perspective, um, less emphasis on the technology because that's already been well covered. So um, very quick intro, we set up our virtual reading room just 12 months ago, in fact, I think we were one of the first UK libraries and archives to establish a virtual reading room. The equipment is fairly standard, so we're using Wolf Vision desktop visualizers. Uh, we're a grade one listed building, so ceiling mounted visualizers are uh, verboten. Um, and we've heard from Bristol about some of the limitations of desktop visualizers. We deliver the virtual reading room service by Microsoft Teams for Manchester users and Zoom for external users. We wanted to keep the technology as simple as possible for remote users, as well as our own staff. To start with, we operated with two members of staff. Now, generally speaking, it's one for efficiency reasons, and we're offering four one-hour sessions per day. 
So far, we've delivered 175 visualizer sessions, and that compares with 225 on site visits during the last 12 months, which is a tiny fraction, obviously, of uh, our normal usage. So, who's using the service? We've done some analysis. Approximately 45% of users are from the University of Manchester. I think the um, relatively low usage by academics probably reflects the fact that they've been pulled in so many different directions this last year, but doing uh, new research has not been a top priority for many of them. Likewise, uh, for the uh, other HEIs, preponderance of students over academic users. And then just over 15% are members of the public or unspecified. Normally, in, in normal circumstances, we would have a higher proportion of public users. We've done some analysis of the geographical distribution of the users. Um, this maps very similarly onto um, our recent trends. So preponderance of folk from Europe and North America. What's interesting, I think, is, is some of the outliers, so to speak. So uh, people from Latin America, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, who arguably, even in normal circumstances, would find it challenging to visit Manchester in person. Within the British Isles, obviously, a very wide geographical spread of users, as you might expect. of users uh, this spring. 86% said that the virtual reading room service was extremely useful, 14% very useful. 90% um, of people are extremely likely to use the service again. When asked whether they had a preference between uh, a future digital appointment or visiting on site, interestingly, uh, it was uh, over two to one in favor of digital appointments. We can return to some of the implications of this later during the discussion. The benefits of the service are fairly obvious, uh, providing access to material that would otherwise have been inaccessible during the pandemic. For researchers, it takes away the time and expense involved in travel to the library. It works best, obviously, for small quantities of well catalogued material, uh, items that the researcher can identify easily in advance of a session. Less good for trawling through large quantities of uh, uncatalogued archives, for example, fishing expeditions. From a student's perspective, um, it's a relatively benign way of introducing them to researching primary source material, and they can fit it in around their, their busy social and pedagogical lives. We've also found that it's used a great deal by researchers as a preliminary to making an on-site visit, particularly um, since the relaxation of lockdown earlier this year. We've had a comment that the, the high-res visualizers that we're using can actually see better than the naked eye. That's another unexpected benefit. Looking forward, uh, we think there's potential for people uh, being able to compare material in different institutions through uh, a visualization session, through live streaming, uh, uh, perhaps sitting in the Rylands and doing a live stream from Glasgow, for example, or Bristol. And something I'm going to return to is how this service changes the status of reader services staff turns them into research assistants. Obviously, there are drawbacks. Um, comments that we've received are that researchers can feel a little awkward, particularly at the beginning, about directing library staff. As I say, it's quite difficult to trawl through large quantities of material online. It's quite hard also to replicate the materiality and aura of the original object, however good the, the digital images might be. The desktop visualizers, as we heard from colleagues at Bristol, aren't suitable for large items such as maps and posters. Um, 
we have recently invested in some um, ceiling mounted visualizers at the main library in our map room to address that issue. Clearly, if material is being requested repeatedly through the virtual reading room service, it will be better to digitize it once and for all. And we have had a few suggestions about how to make the process slightly easier through an online booking form, doing pre-flight checks to iron out any technical issues before the session starts. So I've done a couple of interviews recently with uh, a researcher and an MPhil student to get their um, take on the service. Um, Dr. Emily Price is a visiting research fellow at the John Wines Research Institute and Library. Um, she's based in Michigan and in fact her entire research project has been conducted remotely through visualizer sessions. I hope you can uh, hear her. Um, yeah, I think, I think the virtual reading room experience does change the interactions between uh, the researcher and the staff um, in that it becomes a much more intimate process, which is, as I say, a little bit awkward at first. Um, but then, uh, and, and also I can anticipate that when I was looking at the broadsheets, they're quite large. And so that, you know, there involved a lot of maneuvering, but that was, that worked out pretty well. Um, I do anticipate that when I'm looking at the next collection I want to look at, which is private letters, which are, of course, going to be handwritten and not printed. I can see how that might be a little trickier because um, I'm going to want to pause more and, and sit there and read while the staff member just holds still. And I, I can anticipate me finding that a little awkward to ask another human being to stand perfectly still while I read something. But <laughs> because, you know, but um, it, whereas, you know, traditionally I would take the letters with me, I'd be at a desk by myself, I'd be on my own time schedule. You know, I'd be able to flip back, you know, to something that I didn't quite catch, you know. So I can anticipate when it's something that requires a little bit of a, of a closer read and a deciphering of handwriting, that might be a little more awkward. But at the same time, I think, I think all of that is in my own head. I don't actually think the staff member minds, <laughs> like, holding on. So what I anticipate will happen is that um, this will be, again, a little bit awkward at first, and then I will just get caught up in what I'm reading. And... Um, yeah, in a way, you know what was kind of nice is when I was looking at these broadsheets, um, I was I found a couple of things that were surprising, and I was able to express my surprise out loud and have the researcher be like, "I know, isn't that interesting?" So, or the staff member rather. So, I think I think actually that was that was kind of neat. It's a different way of looking at these objects because you're looking at that in tandem with another human person, but um, it's a way that I can see being rewarding in its own way. No, the the slip she referred to. Um our colleague as a, as a researcher. And then Harriet Aspin is an MPhil student at Cambridge uh, studying uh, Li Wan Chia. Uh, she uh, undertook a number of virtual reading room sessions uh, over the winter prior to visiting the library in person. I did uh, feel the need to go visit the library in person, particularly when it opened, because I knew there were all of these boxes of photographs and slides, which would really add in terms of being a history of art degree, I would like as much sort of visual reference as possible. Um, and there are all of these photographs that haven't been published. And it was really helpful for me to actually see those to kind of understand what the space was like. Uh, there are occasionally some photographs of the kind of uh, exhibition installation process. So all of those things were actually really useful in terms of framing my uh, dissertation slightly differently. It, it felt more kind of comprehensive in terms of getting a sense of how the museum operated and also I mean Lee built this museum himself and there are all these photos of him labouring, there are videos of him labouring so to see all of those things in person <clears throat> I think was really helpful um, so I did feel the need to come and visit. Um, so I think um, this raises a number of interesting issues around the relationship between researchers and reading room or search room staff uh, traditionally um, in our library and, and across the sector, search room or reading room staff have been perceived as, or actually are, lower in the organisation than, than curatorial experts. Um, I think we're seeing a new model emerging possibly where reading room staff become research partners, engaged participants in the research process. Uh, and this, I think, speaks to the AHRC's um, recent um, change of heart around the research um, status of, of libraries themselves. 
And this clearly does have implications perhaps for the future status, skills, and perhaps even grading of staff involved in, in, this, uh, in this activity. So very quickly, uh, looking to the future, I think it's still too early to predict the long-term demand for virtual reading rooms and the potential impact on in-person visits. But we certainly at Manchester see virtual reading rooms as a long-term business as usual service. We're planning that they will continue and you know, hopefully expand. No plans to charge, but clearly there is a significant cost involved in terms of the staff time, uh, as well as the infrastructure that we've created. At Manchester, we have a very sophisticated virtual classroom, which I haven't described, um, whereas the virtual reading room service is, is more basic. And I think there's probably scope for uh, bringing the, the equipment together. And in the long term, I would hope that we can develop some sort of digital uh, media um, suite um, for the virtual reading room and uh, virtual classroom. Thank you. That was great, John. Thank you very much. Um, if I could ask all the panelists to, to kick the cameras and mics back on uh, while everybody's doing that. John, uh, your last point is, is really interesting. Uh, for, for all of these activities, they do require space, you know, to do any kind of virtual activity, um, you know, having what is essentially a studio space, which is separate potentially from teaching spaces or, or physical reading room spaces, something that is, is a, a concern. Uh, before we get into kind of nuts and bolts, I just want to remind everybody that uh, the Q&A uh, section is open. If you could drop questions into the Q&A, we've already got a couple in. Uh, and there's been some some good banter in the in the chat window as well. A lot of folks chiming in on uh, some of the kit that they've been using or employing, um, including some of the some of the kit that we've talked about, but also using GoPros and iPads and all kinds of things. So it's been been great to to hear um, that uh, everybody's been experiencing these kind of things. Um, before we dive into the the Q and A's that are in the box, I just want to pick up on on something that Siobhan mentioned, but which applies to all three of the, the case studies, which is around equ equitability. Um, that in in some ways these technologies um, provide a more equi equitable experience for um, for users on a, a multitude of spectrums. I'm just thinking, you know, the, that kind of standard paradigm of teaching with a, a, a and a collection item in class and only the people that are kind of over the shoulder of the instructor can see exactly what they're talking about and so you have to kind of pass it around or make all the students move around a, a table or whatever where instead in these scenarios that we've seen at, at all three institutions everybody is is there right in in the kind of in the virtual world kind of hovering right above you um i'd like to to ask all three of you what the buy-in process has been like with the users well, well I'll, I'll, i want to ask about administrators as well but um, how quickly did you find users adapting to the new environment? Was there um, cases where you had to, you know, walk people through trepidation or was it all kind of you know, students and academics alike? What, what's been the experience on the ground for you all? I'll jump in. Oh, sorry, John, go for it. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, everybody's hugely enthusiastic and hugely grateful for the service that we've been providing in these exceptional times. Um, I think people have taken to it very easily. I think, you know, people have pivoted, to use that terrible term, <laughs> overnight to uh, online for virtually everything. So uh, it's not that alien now. Um, I mean, two years ago, perhaps, there would have been resistance to or online access to, to the reading rooms. Um, we don't perceive that as being an issue now. But I think that the other question, which is really important, is avoiding a, a situation in a, in a classroom, for example, where on-site experience is much richer than the, the online. And we need to find a way of um, leveling up or leveling down, I don't know which, but, but certainly leveling that playing field. I agree with you. And I see in, in behind Lucy, the big screen that she's got behind her, we've got a, a similar setup at Edinburgh, where in the classroom, you now have this big screen, so you can just kind of magnify and show. So it, even that is a really interesting development technologically for, for classroom settings, being able to kind of show off something underneath the camera. Um, Siobhan, you were going to jump in and then maybe Bristol? Yeah, uh, um, just picking up on John's point there, I think um, that uh, how we work through the hybrid 
space because I think regardless of whether we're in level zero and everything's back to normal, there will be, there will be people who can't travel. There might be people who are having to isolate. So it's how do we, you know, I think we need to think carefully um, that, that we don't disadvantage those who can't be in the room if the room is the predominant number. Um, and yeah, I don't have any absolute sort of wonderful, clear idea of, of that. But I think it, we need to be mindful. Um, but um, thank you about making the point about accessibility. I think it is an important aspect for, for all these technologies. Great. And did anybody from Bristol want to jump in, Joe? Um, well, Bristol, I think, is different to other universities and that they took an approach that we would not do hybrid teaching. So teaching has either been completely in person for courses that have required it or completely online. So in terms of accessibility and equality of access, we haven't faced that sort of tension between some people in the room, some people outside of the room. Next year, I think we may be going hybrid. So that is something that we will, we will really need to consider. I, I mean, that's a really important point that uh, all of these developments, we're, we're working within the constraints of our own universities as well. So some of the decisions that we've had to make have been influenced by whichever way that the university decides it's going to take things as well. And that will continue to influence influence us. Um, I wanted to ask before. I, ooh, yeah, Julian, go ahead. I'm just going to say that our art history students doing the, the curating students absolutely loved it. because You were able to take these snapshots of the material which they then took away and uploaded to their mural lab. So they had a virtual reading room they, they created for themselves of, of materials that they could keep returning to. Mm. And they really used their own initiative and they started having their own classes outside, away from the tutor, and were able to make a lot of independent creative decisions that they'd then bring back to the next um, session. So rather than when you, you all come into an archive normally and then you're... you're, you're you look at material, then it all gets packed away and they don't have recourse to it. Or maybe there's a few snapshots independently, but they don't have that kind of group recourse to it. Using this really enabled them to do that. And as a result, their kind of, their, their curatorial ideas, I think just came on in leaps and bounds. That's brilliant. And actually that, uh, that leads in quite nicely. So that, that kind of, the element that you showed off there, Julian, of, of taking a screenshot, you know, while you're while you're in 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 session, as it were, there's a question that came in from <clears throat> Peter Finley about digitization workflows and how, you know, will some of this kit and functionality replace some of the digitization requests we get? Will it help influence? You know, how will this affect the workflows that we get um, from going from a classroom or a consultation or a reading room setting into um, digitized material? So, in terms of the in terms of that exhibition kind of workflow we're able to do a lot of on the fly kind of capturing. And then the, the, the materials that they wanted to use as part of the exhibition, we were able to create high res scans for that they could use afterwards. So it was like a two stage process. Um, that's how it worked for us. Yeah. John, Siobhan, have you thought about digitization in, in relation to, to what we've been talking about today? John might have froze, frozen there. Um, I'm, I know that my, uh, the, the, the teams are getting a lot of requests for follow-up uh, digital uh, content and it's also as a, a surrogate to, to having been able to do the classes. We've, we've um, we focused our teaching uh, in the teaching classroom or with our own, camp, with our own colleagues based in Glasgow to manage capacity so that, we, that and so that we were learning as we went along. Um, so um, I think there's there's going to be, I think there is, a, you know, this, that digitization workflow is a really important thing to re review again. I think it's, it's coming into the new academic year as well, um, working on the pace of, of, of academics who are very tired at this time of year, going to take a break and then as ever coming into the August, September period and, and looking to, to think about the new classes. Um, so I think capacity and managing our capacity to deliver this is going to be is, is quite tense, maybe. Um, uh, the, uh, the success that we've had so far, um, we might not be able to compete with it or, or um, so how, how do we say, how do we, how do we plan um, what we can deliver and deliver it well? Yeah. We're finding that the virtual reading room service is reducing the, the number of um, small scale one off demands for images because that can be serviced through the virtual reading room itself. But actually, there's more traffic 
in terms of larger projects. Um, so people will look at material through the virtual reading room service, determine that this is you know, meaty stuff for them, and then we'll put in large orders, which does have some uh, capacity, causes some capacity problems for our team because they're having to operate at a reduced um, rate due to, to social distancing measures. Yeah, just following up on, on John's point there, um, I'm hearing uh, that, that quite a few people are, are academics are, are, are switching their travel grants to, to digitization money and the digitized. So just as John says, um, quite large research-based photography being required. Um, and how do you build that into your workflow with all the other projects you want to do and the support towards teaching and research um, uh, institution as well? So I think it's an absolutely critical bit of, of staffing and resource that, that we need to, um, to kind of talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a big capacity issue for all of us if, if we're going to see a big shift in that direction. Um, while we're in the space, in the kind of classroom space before, there, we've got a, a number of questions that are coming, which is great, also about um, the reading room, but specifically in the classroom, um, there was a question which I'd like to ask, but also nuance a little bit too. So the question around um, in the classroom setting, if you're delivering a class, do you record the session? And if you record the session, is there any kind of data protection form or any kind of statement that they need to agree to? And my nuance to that too is, uh, do you do any teaching with um, uh, data protected material or copyrighted material? And, and what has been your experience with that as well? I'll, my, my response on the question around the DP question, pass. Um, I'm sure the team have this um, looked at or it's, it's done through this participants in, in the sort of school and through the college, but I'm, I'm, I, I can't answer um, on the specifics. In terms of data protection, or sorry, copyrighted materials, um, I think probably the theatre archive might have some, some more thoughts on that, but from my understanding is that we've not been working with, with uh, uh, any copyright materials. And, um... Yeah, we've chosen materials deliberately where either things are out of copyright or we own the copyright so far in teaching. Yeah, I think that's the, the next big step for these services is to understand what, what is within copyright law and, and data protection and, and what can't be as well. Uh, right, I'm gonna to pivot to just a, 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 well, I'm gonna conflate a couple of questions about the, the virtual reading room service. I mean, these are for, for John specifically, but for anybody who's thought about or, or looking at offering the reading room service. Uh, and it's more about kind of longevity and sustainability. Uh, you know, what we've been through in the past year with uh, successive lockdowns has meant that we've had staff capacity that could help deliver virtual reading room services. But we move into a period where our reading rooms will hopefully be busy again. Um, what's the sustainability? You know, how are we going to staff the, the virtual side of things? Is it going to require, I mean, we already, already talked about facilities, but is it going to require, you know, reading room opening times, for example, or... Or, or deployment of kit in other spaces. Um, what's the, the the kind of medium term game look like in terms of virtual reading room? It's a very difficult question. It's one that we're, we're wrestling with. Um, we're, we're just going through a major restructure, and I have been able to provide a little bit of more, a little bit more resource for our reader services team, um, which which helps. We're, we're not planning anytime soon to return to our full opening hours pre-pandemic. So there's an opportunity there to um, switch the emphasis from on-site to, to virtual. But as I said in my presentation, I think it's a bit still too early to understand what the long-term effects of the pandemic and the, the provision of these digital services will have on, on demand for on-site. Um, but I know, I know obviously there are these discussions um, around a national network. And I think while at Manchester, we're very happy to provide this service indefinitely for external researchers. I think you know, ultimately questions have to be asked about how much resource we can put into this um, without being supportive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, certainly at Edinburgh, we're looking at virtual reading room service as well, but it would mean closing down the physical reading room for at least one day so that we can offer that and then pivot back to the physical for, for three or four days per week. 
and that has you know implications for for those that would want to use the physical service as well. Uh, right, I'm going to conflate another two questions and then one more question. Thank you, everybody, uh, for all the questions that have been coming in. It's been great to have uh, so much um, activity in the in the Q and A box. Uh, question about research and the research journey for everybody. Um, so uh, a couple of questions. One, um, I think John, the, the your first video provoked an interesting conversation that, that's played out in the Q and A's around um, library staff being part of that research journey in a different way and having that ability that we wouldn't necessarily have in a reading to have that conversation or to share in the enthusiasm or in that discovery process in a much more intimate setting. Uh, but also how that might change the future of research bids, for example, as well. So uh, there was a question from from Alan, uh, Alan Sudlow, thinking about the kit that we're using now or that we're thinking about employing, you know, will that change the nature of research bids, you know, instead of um, researchers needing to, to factor in you know, 30,000 pounds for travel grants and accommodation and things? Uh, what, have we had any kind of initial signs of, of things changing? or things being affected by the, the technology that we're using? We've started to have conversations in Bristol with academic researchers from other institutions who are putting in big bids about how we might cost our time as partners or collaborators in terms of how they might use the reading room. But we're just, just at the very, very early stages of that yeah. at the moment. We know we've, we're a small team, there's 4.7 FTEs running the whole of the theatre collection as core staff. We know that we're transitioning from a stage where we had our archive assistant supervising a reading room with maybe 10 different researchers, students, external academics, creative practitioners in there, to a situation where we're looking at a one-on-one -on -one yeah. relationship for the virtual reading room. So it has potentially a huge impact for us. Just very quickly on, on space, because that, uh, that was touched on by John as well. Um, in, we, we are in a very fortunate position, and I know, know a lot of places aren't. We had a previously dedicated seminar room uh, to work with our collections. It was a smaller of a suite of two rooms, a large reading room. Um, and actually what the, the team are proposing to do is to, um, or we're getting a similar kit in both spaces and we're, ch we're changing the furniture to allow a quick turnaround so we can flip the spaces. So if a class comes in that's that little bit bigger but we still want social distancing, we can turn the reading room into the seminar into the reading room, bring them into the, to the seminar room. There's also the, 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 the trade-off of having the, the, the virtual reading room and the intrusion of, of uh, into a, a, a more traditional study space. So can you have them, uh, you know, can you have them side by side or do you have to, as you say, shut one down to allow the other to, to happen? It's tricky. And tricky for people who are coming for extended study, like are uh, visiting research fellows that we, we want to come and actually spend some time with us. How do we, how do we give them five full days to maximise their, their research uh, leave? We're, we're just thinking about um, the whole issue of costing our contributions to research proposals and being more realistic about the, um, the cost to us, not just um, real cost, but opportunity costs, costing in staff time and um, pushing more of that onto the, the applications rather than off us offering to do work gratis. Um, so I, I can see that we, we need to get better at providing realistic costs for, um, as Bristol are thinking, uh, the costs of um, library time spent on a, on a virtual reading room service. You could imagine having an embedded research assistant within the library staff for a major research project, for example, and we need to be able to cost that realistically. Great. Um, uh, there are more questions in the Q and A, and especially one or two about national infrastructure, which I will not park for now, and we'll come back to it at, at the end of the session because I think the next next um, uh, presentation from Joanne will will help steer some of that conversation. So I wanted to to thank our panelists uh, for the presentations uh, and also for this first round of Q and A. But don't go anywhere because I'm going to call you back in in about fifteen minutes or so. Uh, so if I could ask you all to camera and mic off, and now I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Joanne Fitton. Joanne is uh, co-convener uh, in the RLUK Special Collections 
Leadership Network, and she'll be talking to you today about uh, some of the work that RLU UK has been doing in this space as well. Joanne, over to you. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, this next part of the session, I'm going to be talking about the headline results and preliminary findings of the recent RLU UK survey on virtual reading rooms and virtual teaching spaces. So we're going to be using Mentimeter in this part of the session too. And to access the Mentimeter, please copy the Mentimeter link into your browser, which I think is in the chat now, or go to mentimeter.com and enter the code that's on the screen as well. But please don't feel distracted by this straight away. We're gonna have time in the session um, to go through the questions. So I'll start with the survey. And as you've seen, Many collection holding institutions have been actively exploring new and innovative ways to produce digital access through the pandemic. And institutions have been experimenting to provide geographically remote digital access without reliance on digitisation. Various discussions have been taking place between members of the RLUK Special Collections Network and a cross member working group from RLUK has been supporting ongoing development in this area. So a survey of RLUK members was undertaken in January and it revealed the potential scope and reach of these services as well as having a variety of purposes. And as a result, a second more extensive survey was undertaken between May and June of this year, reaching out beyond the RLUK membership. It was extensively promoted by RLUK national and international partners and the survey was directed at services that already offer virtual reading room and teaching room services and those intending to create them. So you've already had very good explanation and demonstration of what we mean by virtual reading rooms and teaching spaces. The survey sought to establish the extent to which research libraries, archives and museums were creating virtual reading rooms and teaching services within the UK and internationally the experiences of collection holding institutions in creation of these services, their current use and requirements, the opportunities and challenges these services have presented for institutions, staff and the users, the institutional context in which these services operate, including how they were funded and how they sat alongside physical and digital services and opportunities that the development and delivery of virtual reading rooms and teaching services provide for collaboration between collection holding institutions. So the survey asked detailed questions regarding technological, spatial, financial, staffing and skills requirements. It asked about the use of services by researchers and user groups, how these were resourced by institutions and the motivation for creating and maintaining them. It concluded with questions regarding possibilities for collaboration between collection holding institutions around the development and delivery of services, including in relation to the creation of a national and international network between them, exchange of skills and the creation of agreed standards and development of use. So there were 32 overall responses for in, from institutions varying in size, geography and remit. And the survey revealed that these are emerging services. 56% of those who responded already had virtual reading rooms, 38% had virtual teaching services, and others who responded were intending to create them. But we know that there were many other institutions that were interested in the survey, but didn't feel that their ideas and plans had developed far enough to participate at this time. Of those who responded, only one service predated the pandemic, and most in the UK have been created during lockdowns. And it seems that few places are actively promoting the services so far. But there is a shift in status for both virtual reading rooms and virtual teaching spaces. This is going from a pragmatic response to a crisis to a bespoke research service being established. It's a slow process and it's not matured yet. There's a wide range of capacity from one to two appointments a month to up to 30 appointments a month by services. And places range from being able to accommodate one to three concurrent sessions, and most tend to be under an hour. So if we think about the user experience, the application of this service is broadening. 
The virtual reading rooms, where initially focus was on serving internal audiences, many are now finding that the primary audience is from users outside their organisation. The virtual teaching space setup is seen as important for schools, community groups and widening participation audiences. Virtual teaching spaces are fewer in number, but there is an expanding audience beyond the institution. There are benefits that larger groups of students can be included in a session when teaching was all face to face. There's also an emergence of hybrid on-site and online sessions, especially for the next academic session. And as we'd anticipate at this stage, arts and humanities are the most significant disciplines being served. There's also an archives and special collections bias to the results so far in terms of the type of material being consulted. But this is diversifying with museum art 3D presentation combined with data visualizations and shared screen functionality, demonstrating cross collection and format application. And places are putting restrictions in place based on the size of material, condition of material, and access conditions as you'd expect in the reading room. And in terms of copyright, there are questions around whether this is considered to be broadcasting. And the motivation of users is really important for us to understand in the viability of services going forward. And this seems to be fitting into five broad categories. So we have geographical motivations where people are unable to visit in person and the convenience when a physical visit might be unwarranted. There's a big investigative element to it to assess if a physical visit is warranted. So a lot of people using service for reference checking and digitization, as we've heard in the previous presentations, it is um, going some way to inform digitization requests. If you could move on slide for me, Mel, that'd be great. Thank you. So respondents reported delivering multiple sessions a month via their virtual teaching space, largely focused on supporting teaching within arts, humanities and social sciences. Some practice based sessions were delivered virtually, including in support of conservation courses and museum studies courses. But it's quite early to tell how much this is being integrated into curriculum design. At present, it is seen as a valuable addition, enabling work with larger cohorts of students. Most respondents are offering digitization on demand already, and half of the respondents to the survey are offering opportunistic digitisation of the items being consulted in the sessions. So at the moment, there's only been a modest impact on digitisation and cataloguing prioritisation within services. There is a change in staff researcher dynamic, as we've heard a lot about in the case studies. It's showcasing staff expertise and knowledge, and it's mutually beneficial and a co-creative experience. It's involving colleagues from across the library, but there are very few dedicated roles. And it's acting as a catalyst for collaborative research, but raising questions about staffing levels and roles. The main skills needed seems to be quite generic, including confidence in public speaking and in handling collections. So the requirements of the services seem pretty, pretty much the same across virtual reading rooms and virtual teaching spaces. There is a low tech baseline to achieve good results, but it's possible to go high tech as well. And costs can range from a few hundred pounds to multiple thousands of pounds. Most have turned to internal funding so far. A variety of spaces are being used as well, mainly with practicality in mind, plugs, Wi-Fi connectivity, space. For virtual teaching services, it's that more space is needed than for virtual reading rooms. And mobility and flexibility seem to be key to the decisions being made. So in terms of sustainability, this all seems doable in quiet building spaces. Lots of respondents are still pondering where the services should be located permanently, where they should be located permanently. And as we've heard, staffing resource is the largest cost. Few places are considering charging for the service at this stage, but might change their minds on that as demand increases. 
So just move slide again, thanks, Mill. So finally, respondents were interested in understanding the potential for collaboration. And this is in, including skills development, so the creation of collaborative approaches for staff and users to gain new skills, knowledge sharing of best practice and lessons learned, some of what we're doing here today. There is benchmarking regarding the use of these services, thinking about common standard frameworks to support interoperability and the ease of navigation between virtual reading rooms at different institutions, and troubleshooting by creating a community of practice. Having a networked approach seems to be of interest, exploring the development and delivery of combined appointments, including virtual reading rooms at multiple institutions. So, as I said at the start, this is an emerging service. We're really keen to gather more evidence of what's happening in this space right across the sector and challenge assumptions we may be making to find way, ways to collaborate further. In particular, RL UK would like to explore the potential for a coordinated and networked approach to the creation and delivery of these services and whether they present new opportunities for cross-institutional and cross-sector collaboration. The full report um, of the findings of the survey is now published on the RL UK website, offering a summary of the findings, but also acting as an invitation to institutions and stakeholders to join RL UK in discussions around use and development of these services. And alongside that, the survey is going to be staying open for more contributions to come forward as we know that people are working in this area. So we're going to take advantage of the captive audience that is here today to get a sense of level of interest and the Mentimeter that we are running is focused on the virtual reading room service um, really. We aren't um, looking so much at the teaching services um, in this session. So this is where we're asking for you to um, participate and it looks like people have already um, kicked that off and it's good to see that there are still 119 participants in the room. I don't know how, I think we've got quite as many um, participating in the Mentimeter yet. It'd be great if people did um, um, contribute wherever possible, we would like to get a sense of the interest in these services. So I appreciate that that first question is always the tricky one for um, many of us. Um, about how we would describe ourselves. Um, now, I'd welcome any of the panelists to come in to comment on um, anything that appears in the answer to these questions as they come in. But I think um, this is an answer that we're expecting really to understand who was in our audience today. That it's mostly um, people working in the um, library, archive, museum sector rather than us having much of an academic researcher or student audience today. Uh, special, special shout out to the student, the 3% student and 3% academic, so it's nice to have you amongst us. It's lovely. Yeah, so hopefully um, you are um, interested in using or are already using these kinds of services. So I think um, we will move on to the next question. Number two. Oh, good already been answered there. So has your institution created a virtual reading room? Or if not, would you be interested? Okay. That's an interesting split, kind of three-way three -way split. Yeah, there's quite a lot undecided there. And I, yeah, it, it does feel that there is still a lot that we're all trying to learn about it and where we can have had quite low tech responses. I know in my service, we've had quite a low tech response to be able to do this, but there is that pressure of how um, it's going to skew maybe other parts of the service that we already offer. Mm. And I think um, on that, we've got, if you're not interested to put it in, comment in the chat. Yeah. So, I'm not quite sure why people wouldn't be interested. It, it might be the scale, the type of service that you run, or if you're a user, it might be it might be something that's been coming up in what's been said that it would be useful to understand what barriers people feel that they would have to use in these services as well. 
so that we don't create things that um yeah have barriers put in their place that um, would be off-putting we already know that our physical spaces can be difficult for people to use sometimes i'm conscious of time so i'll skip to question three so if you have one or would like to create one what advantages or benefits you experienced or expect a lot of really helpful comments coming through here Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great comment about not having enough individual scans we kind of touched on that already in the q a it's it's yeah really great to be able to, to to respond to inquiries really quick and easy with institutional equipment instead of your own cell phone and that question of equitable services mm -hmm. coming up again mm-hmm and yeah, I think it, there are there are different advantages in terms of accessibility that um, I think they're about disability, different kinds of access issues that people might have for um, on site visits. There are there are different that is, I suppose, maybe solving diff different problems that we might have experienced. This is all really great. Thank you for these contributions because this will all add to our evidence base as we are thinking about different ways to collaborate and um, keep thinking about ways to support this kind of activity through services. So um, on the next question, if your service offered virtual read room sessions, how might these influence other aspects of provision? So we ask people to just select their top three. I'll give this another minute. We've only got 18 responses in here so far. Mm, poor cataloging. Hey, someone gave 2% to cataloging, all right. <laughs> But you know, it's quite an even spread across the boards, uh, the kind of digitization, but then also the kind of access uh, mm. in what we would normally have kind of crowd environments as well. And I suppose I'm, I'm conscious that um, all of us on this panel today have contributed to the survey. I'm sure we, I'm sure our institutions have been contributors to it. Um, I'm just, that question of integration into the curriculum and um, I was conscious of John saying about how academics haven't made a huge amount of use yet of the services and whether there's, you know, what, what kind of advocacy do we need to do there to, um, to, to help integrate this into the curriculum. And that point around collaboration with other repositories, I don't know whether anybody has tried that yet, really, to this idea of um, multiple institutions at once um, using the visualizer. I don't know whether anybody on the panel has done that at all. It's not something we've tried out at Edinburgh, Siobhan. Yeah, we, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to do that within the institution with, a, with our, our colleagues in the Hunterian Museum. Um, so that we might be able to deliver a, a shared object-based teaching experience. Um, but we're slightly, well, that's trialing it maybe in the, in the first semester next year. Okay, and then we've got the next question. So, if a collaborative network was to be created to support development and delivery of virtual reading rooms, where would it make the greatest impact? So, the options there, creating national standards for the development and use of virtual reading rooms, sharing case studies, regarding the use and development. So we've got 
nobody thinking national standards is the, the something for to be concentrated on, but case studies seem reasonably popular. Creating a troubleshooting network for institutions. A few votes there. Supporting smaller institutions to develop services seems to be popular as well. A national directory to identify who offers these services. Perhaps this is just so early doors on um, the development of services um, that that's getting no traction there. Interoperability, a few votes on that. And then publicising the existence of services to funders and advocates, advocate for greater funding, again popular. I did wonder about the um, publicity for these services and whether any of us are really um, publicising them. I know in the survey results it didn't, it suggested that people weren't really doing that yet. And I wonder whether that's because we are all a bit concerned about the amount of um, work that could bring if, it, if it's a capacity issue or whether, it, is there another reason that we would not be in a position to be doing much publicity around it yet? We, at Bristol, we haven't publicised it. We offer it when we feel that it's going to be something that's useful, but it's absolutely down to a capacity issue, which is why we haven't advertised it more widely yet. Yeah. Yeah. So it's on the website at Manchester, but you have to look very hard to find it because, again, we're a little bit concerned about creating demand that we can't fulfil. Yeah. We're the same at Leeds that we, if, if somebody asks about it, we um, we encourage them to do that. Um, but And it's on the website, but we don't really push it out any further than that. So I think the idea of a national directory feels like it's probably some way off being a priority for people. Joanne, there was a, a question that came in in the Q&A, um, in the, the, the first round of Q&A about national infrastructure. Uh, I wonder if we could take that now just with the rest of the panelists. I mean, any thoughts mm -hmm. of what a, a national infrastructure could <laughs> offer or, you know, what would the benefits or the the, the negatives be of a, a national infrastructure for these kind of things? I don't know if uh, John or Joe or uh, Siobhan or anybody had any thoughts on what those, uh, some of this is born out of the idea of being able to indeed to, to have a session where you could log into a reading room and access material, you know, for example, uh, one side of correspondence at Glasgow, another side of correspondence at Edinburgh and see both of them at the same same time. Um, but, you know, do we need infrastructure to, to underpin that and what, what might that look like? I'm going to say the word capacity again. I think that's where we, we're all hesitant to, um, to over promise um, and very mindful of um, that staff have, have had a really difficult um, year and a half and that there's a lot of change, uh, a lot of demand on times and skills and things. So I think it's, um, I think it's again, early days to understand seeing where, where, what, what that might realistically look like um, and be staffed. Um, I think there's good, trial opportunities though, um, from those who've already got established services um, to kind of test out what the issues are and to learn from those. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear what any, any other panelists thoughts are. I would completely echo your thoughts. This is down to capacity. I think there's amazing potential for collections that are split across institutions or related work. I think it'd be absolutely fantastic for researchers but again, it's it's the physical capacity of being able to run a virtual reading room and the staff capacity, which, which all boils down in the end to funding and resources. But yeah, so much potential out there to, to do that inter-institutionally inter and also to reach beyond the HE sector and work with other partners as well. I mentioned the potential benefits um, in terms of being able to compare material in different institutions in practice, I'm not sure whether that's best delivered through a virtual reading room service or through um, other online mechanisms. I think that the greatest potential benefits of a national network, as, as we say, are around uh, 
sharing of best practice. Um, so I, I, I capacity issues at the moment. Thanks. Shall we put up the last question? Just yep. which was around what might you want to learn more before investing in such services? So cost benefit is definitely there for people. So it feels like maybe some of those um, ideas around best practice and case studies will be helpful to people. Um, more of these types of sessions, I guess, um, to promote what's going on. And um, I know there's a very willing um, network of people that are doing this already who are very open to talk to people and um, offer advice one-on-one um, -on -one about what they're investing in and um, what the experience has been. This is really great. There's a, a lot of really good content in here, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is this is all really helpful for the next steps for RR UK and the um, small working group that's been um, thinking in this area about how we can um, do more on the collaboration side of things. So um, understanding what the hesitations might be or the other learning that people need is yeah. set us in the right direction with some of those different conversations that we're having. Um, to advocate for what the potential could be.